Satan wants you to worship. You ever think about that? Satan wants you and your heart to be fully devoted, but not to God. Satan doesn't mind. He wants you to be devoted to your career before God. He wants you to be so committed to your children that you get them involved in so many things that you don't have time to go to church. He wants you to be so committed to life itself and enjoying life and and going out and being out there at the lake, at the beach, in the mountains, wherever it is, enjoying nature and not worshiping God. We're going to see a story here this morning from Daniel where Satan is going to give the people in Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom something else to worship besides God. In this context, it's an image. We're not sure what the image is. We'll we'll get there in in a minute. But he wants to give them something else to, to focus on. Satan wants to do that. Give you something else to focus on, to worship instead of God. Here's the scripture for this morning. It's Daniel chapter 3. And it's 30 verses, the whole thing. So I'll just read selected verses out of here. Uh, starting in verse 1 to give you an idea of what's going on, uh, not going all the way to the end of the story. But King Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king of Babylon, which was a very strong empire, they were in control of Israel and Jerusalem at that time, but they're in Babylon here. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, 90 feet high and 9 feet wide, and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials to come together to to the dedication of the image that he had set up. So they all assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, This is what you're commanded to do, O peoples, nations, and men of every language. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. So apparently they set up the image... The statue is here, and there's also an enforcement over here. There's a blazing furnace right next to it. Well, what happens is the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego don't fall down. So at verse 8, at this time, some astrologers, some of these officials come forward and denounce the Jews. And they say in verse 12, There are Jews whom you've set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. And furious with rage, the king, Nebuchadnezzar, summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and these were brought before the king. Shadrach, in 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, you hear that? Even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that we have the story and the scriptures of these brave men who would not go along with the crowd. We ask that we could learn something from them and from you this morning. May your Holy Spirit be here in in full measure and 
may our hearts and our, our eyes and your ears be open to what it is you have for us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. When Nebuchadnezzar puts up this image and has the artists and craftsmen, whatever, put up the image, things are going in the right way for Satan. Because I said before, Satan wants people to worship, just not worship God. This image is massive, 90 feet tall. This ceiling right here, I, I don't even know how, how tall, who's good at estimating? Ed, how tall is the ceiling? 25, 30 feet, three times the size of this. And it's six feet wide, so it's fairly skinny. If it's a representation of Nebuchadnezzar, it's after Jenny Craig, or uh, <laughs> we could say after the Daniel plan, right? We know about that, yeah. But it doesn't say it's Nebuchadnezzar himself. It might just be some other image or representation of, of one of the Babylonian gods. We don't really know. But they have this image, and all the officials and many other people are gathered around here, and they're supposed to worship when they hear the music. And there's a list of six instruments, and, and other instruments are there. And as soon as they hear it, they're supposed to fall down and worship this thing. It's very much like a religious ceremony. There's probably some preaching going on. There's probably, there's definitely the music going on. There's been offerings in order to, to build this thing. But it's, a, it's like a religious, false religion ceremony. And Satan will do whatever he can to get people to worship this thing. He's given the misdirection as far as worshiping this thing and not God. And now he's going to bring in some intimidation because there is peer pressure. We don't know how many people were here exactly, hundreds or a thousand or thousands. But when they hear the music, everyone in the crowd throws themselves down and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are left standing up. And as they look around, everybody else is down on the ground. And I'm sure that everybody is down like this and they're peeking out. Oh, what's the story with these guys? They're standing out in the crowd, literally, because they have not fallen down to worship. There's peer pressure on them to fall down. Even the people that didn't believe that Nebuchadnezzar was some sort of deity or believe that this image was worthy of worship, if they didn't believe in God, the God, the one God, then they're just going to fall down with everybody else because they know that if they don't worship, well, there's a furnace over there that is pretty hot, and that's, that's their destination if they don't worship. So, the people who believed in Nebuchadnezzar, people who didn't believe in Nebuchadnezzar but didn't have the real God to worship, they've all fallen down. And there is that threat of death. Because if you didn't bow down and worship, there it was, just minutes later. Well, there are, are many Christians today around the world who face persecution, physical persecution. In the Muslim world, and it's not just from ISIS, although ISIS will kill a Christian quickly. There are uh, other governments, Muslim governments, who, who will officially persecute Christians. In China, there's a great deal of persecution right now on believers, the Christians who will not bow down to, to the government. In the Hindu world, uh, we're seeing in India a lot of persecution. But even in the United States, if you're a florist, and you say that you don't want to do certain kinds of weddings because it goes against your personal religious beliefs, look at the shaming. It's not a, well, for a while there was not official government persecution against these people, but there was shaming on Facebook and Twitter and protests in front of the stores. And now we see that there are state governments who are against people who want to carry out their faith in a certain way and remove themselves from, from certain practices. So 
Is that state persecution of Christians? That's for somebody else to define, but it's getting pretty close if it's not. But then there's also people who just, in your life, you know, you know they don't know the Lord, and you want to say something to them, you want to share a moment to to help them to find Christ, and all they do is they say, no, don't talk to me about that. And it's, they're very closed. They don't want to hear it. There are people like that that you know. Pray for them and be faithful in your witness before them because it's never too late. But then doubt is also another thing that Satan uses to, uh, to, to get people off of worshiping the true God. In verse 15, and I have it marked 16 in here, uh, but it's really in verse 15. Nebuchadnezzar is telling these people, if you don't worship this, the end of verse 16, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? What God is there? What he's saying is there is no God who will be able to rescue you. In, in Nebuchadnezzar's experience, in his world, in the, the pantheon of gods that he had with the small g, there was not a God who was more powerful than Nebuchadnezzar. Satan will always try to get you to doubt the existence of God or the goodness of God or the plan of God or the will of God. He will always try to plant a seed in there to get you to doubt the word of God. If you go back to Genesis 3, we're not going back there right now, but that's what the serpent did with, with Eve and then probably with, with Adam. The, well, we're not going there. Satan wants to get you away from the truth of God's word and the reality of God's existence. Know this. When that comes into your mind, when you hear it, maybe somebody else says it or just this thought comes into your, I want, is God really good? Is God really present with me? That is always a lie. Every time you hear that voice, that is a lie. God is always good. God is always present. God is always real. That's what you need to hold on to. And that's what these guys hold on to. Let me read this again in verse 16, because what they say is so powerful. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego tell the king, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, that is so amazing. Even if God does not deliver us, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you've set up. They know that they serve a God who is able to save and who is promised to save. Back in Isaiah Chapter 43, this is what it reads. This is what the Lord says, He who created you, Jacob, he who redeemed you, Israel. For, you, for do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. Sounds like Exodus. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. Sounds like when Israel went, from the, went through the Jordan River. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. This is in their minds and in their hearts, and this is what they're counting on. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. There's a promise there that they're counting on, and they know that God is always faithful to his word, and they're going to put their trust in God. Even if God does not save them in this particular place in this circumstance even if they're not guaranteed to come out of that fire alive or unharmed but for them their part of it is that they will not bow down to the false god they will only worship the true god they're not worried about what the king will do to them they're not worried about what happens to them 
They're only worried about who are they going to worship. Even if God does not save them, they will serve God. Their story shows up in the book of Hebrews uh, in one line in chapter 11, verse 34. There were some who quenched the fury of the flames. But there were others in Hebrews 11 who did not survive the persecutions. It says they were put to death by stoning, they were sawn in two, they were killed by the sword. All of these people in Hebrews 11, this hall of faith that, that is there, they were faithful. God saved some out of their trial. God did not save all out of the trials. But even so, they followed God, every one of them. And our experience tells us that God can save. God can cure this disease or that disease. But it doesn't always happen. That's what makes this story so incredible. Because they refuse to bow down no matter what the circumstances no matter what the result and God in this story God can save God does save Nebuchadnezzar is so mad at it at them that he does these things in verse 19 we see Nebuchadnezzar was so furious with them and his attitude toward them changed he ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual seven times don't know how they measured that because they didn't have thermometers and such like we have today. So it is likely that that is a figure of speech and that it was just make it as hot as it's ever, way hotter than it's ever been. It may be telling us that. And then he commanded the strongest soldiers in his army to tie them up. So they're tied with the strongest knots that there's ever been in, in that kingdom. And these same super soldiers were the ones who were selected to throw them into the fire. Well, in verse 22, verse 21, these men wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, turbans, and other clothes were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot, the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The soldiers themselves were burnt alive and these three men firmly tied fell into the blazing furnace. It was probably a, a structure, a tall structure with the fire down here and a big chimney on here. And they're thrown into the top. There's probably an opening at the bottom. Well, there's definitely an opening at the bottom because we'll see what, what happens here. Well, the fire was so hot it killed the soldiers, but it didn't touch them. It didn't touch their clothes. The ropes that they were bound with were burnt off by this trial, but they themselves were not hurt. They were saved in the fire before they're brought out of the fire, though, we have to see. Nebuchadnezzar looks in and, and sees something going on. Verse 24, the king leaped to his feet in amazement, asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? I mean, guys, tell me. Weren't there three men in there? They replied, certainly, O king. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed. And the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Wow. God was with them. There were some who would say this was an Old Testament appearance of Jesus, the second person of the Trinity. There are others who say, well, this was an angel of the Lord, what, whatever that means in the Old Testament, which could mean it was Jesus. It could have been some other kind of angel. The text does not tell us specifically, so it's, we don't want to go too far in saying this was exactly this. What we know was there was a fourth person, something, someone in there with them. God was with them in some way, in some way that, that the men recognized. Nebuchadnezzar didn't. He said it looks like a son of the gods. Wasn't sure what that was. But these men, God is with them. And notice this. In order to know the saving reality of God's power and God's presence, they had to go in the fire. It wasn't just, it wasn't enough for them to make a statement, 
king, we're not going to worship you. And Nebuchadnezzar saw, whoa, these guys are serious. I'll, I'll, I'll take away this punishment. It wasn't that they got up close and the soldiers around them were killed and somehow they miraculously floated away and just landed softly on the ground over here. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had to go into the fire to know God's presence. Intellectually, they knew Isaiah. They knew all kinds of stories where God saved his people. But they had never witnessed that personally. And they had to go in the fire with their commitment, with their faith. And that's when God saved them. Not till after they got thrown in. Now, from the time that they did not bow down to the statue, to the time when they were going into the furnace, was probably just a matter of minutes because the furnace was already there. Maybe it took a while to get the fire a little bit hotter than usual. An hour went by from the time that they made that commitment that they're not going to bow down until the time that they're in the fire. They did not have a whole lot of time to, to think about this, but they were strong every moment. There are going to be times in your life where you're going to Take a stand, say something, do something, and the negative reaction is going to come pretty fast against you. God is with you. God is with you in that moment. Be firm. Take that stand. Don't be worried about the circumstances that, we're going, that are going on in your life because you will experience God's power. And there will be times when you're in the fire. It's when you're facing that challenging situation that is beyond your resources. When you look at the example of these men, they were willing to follow God no matter what the results are. Are you willing to do that? Is your faith that strong that you would do that? Jesus said you should be afraid of the right things. In Matthew 10, 28, he's, he's gathering his disciples together. It's, it's in the middle of his ministry, and he's trying to train these men. To, they've been with him for a while. They know what his, his priorities are as far as preaching and caring for people. And he's sending them out to, to preach about him. And he says this in the middle of a whole bunch of instructions. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell. What does he mean by that? Because that is one of the stranger things that, that Jesus said. He says, don't be afraid of what people can do to you. Don't be afraid of what people say about you. Don't even be afraid of Satan or what he can do to you, or those who follow him. Don't be afraid of God's enemies at all. Jesus is saying, don't be afraid of those who can touch the outer parts of you. Be afraid of the one who knows the inner parts of you, the one who's in charge of your eternal destiny, and who is that? That's God. Fear God, serve God, and God alone. Don't be misdirected. Don't let your attention wander off from a pure faith in God and a pure trust in God. And don't settle for worshiping anything less than God. And don't be intimidated, but fear God alone. Have faith. Here's a closing illustration. Paul Sabold was part of our phase two planning team, uh, along with Linda, uh, Charlie, Ed, uh, Claire was there, uh, Dave, where'd Dave go? 
Um, am I missing somebody? Myself? Um, no, I think I said Linda. Um, but there was a, a phase two planning group. And the first time we got together to meet was about two years ago, I'll just say, ish. What if at that first meeting we were to be, we were open up a, a fortune cookie or something and it said, when this building is done on Druck Valley Road, one of you will be done here on the earth. What if we'd had that knowledge that our, our faith and the faith of this church would, it wouldn't lead to, but it would certainly be a, a, a point along the way. Would there have been a second meeting that one of you is not gonna survive past the construction of this? I hope that there, that the faith of all of our church would be enough to say, yes, if this is for the Lord, if this is from the Lord, if this is part of our faith in the Lord, then yes. And I'm not saying there's a connection between those two. One caused the, the other. But when you are making decisions in your life, are you saying the same thing that these guys did? That your life is at risk your health is at risk, your finances are at risk when you, when you make a faith commitment to God. And God can save you out of anything. He saved these guys out of the furnace. But even if God doesn't save you, are you still keeping your eyes on the Lord and not the circumstances? Are you still willing to go with Him wherever He would lead you? regardless of what happens. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this example of these men here and the example that, that you gave to us of, of your ability to save uh, miraculously out of incredible circumstances. Lord, we ask that, that our eyes would be on you, not on, not on the pain, but, but on your presence in the pain, and not on our circumstances, but on the one who saves us in and out of circumstances. Lord, help us to keep our focus on you in every way, not doubting, not being misdirected at all, not being intimidated by the world or, or those who are against you, but help us to stand strong with you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.